Just let it be and see what... <coughs> Good morning, St. John's. Thank you all for gathering this morning. I, as you can see, am in a different location than I usually am. I am on my way, about to leave for my vacation. I, well, I kind of already left. So I'm traveling to North Carolina and I traveled with uh, two friends of mine who have been my social distancing buddies for the, the past um, month or so. And we traveled to Cincinnati, which is where we are now, staying with um, Tony's parents, my friend Tony's parents. And then um, the three of us will leave from here today to go to North Carolina. And I'm going to be on vacation for two weeks. So when I'm on vacation, I want you to know that Jan and Robert will still be available, will still be having our regular services. If you're in need of uh, pastoral care during that time, Pastor John Lang is going to be on call. So you, some of you may have his information already, otherwise you can get his information from Jan at the church office and you can call him if you need anything. For our service next week, you will be, um, receiving wonderful preaching from a good friend of mine who's a pastor in Seattle. Her name is Ellie Vergao, and she is a pastor at First Covenant Church on Capitol Hill in Seattle. And so she will be with you next week. And then the week after that, you will have preaching from Pastor Jason Williams, who is the current pastor of Shekinah Chapel, where Pastor Curry used to be the pastor, and he is now the bishop. So we will not be having communion for either of those services because the Covenant Church is technically not in full communion with the Lutheran Church and Ellie is a Covenant Church pastor next week. And then Jason uh, from Shekinah Chapel, while that is a Lutheran Church, he technically hasn't gone through the full process to become a pastor yet. He has special permission to serve at Shekinah Chapel and he's going to be starting seminary this fall, uh, but he doesn't have permission to do communion in other places. So we will be without communion for those two weeks, uh, but we will have wonderful preaching and singing and it will be, I hope it will be very enriching to hear different, different people in the pulpit. That being said, before I go on vacation today, we will be having our congregational meeting. So please stay right after the worship service today. We'll maybe have five minutes of transition time and we will pick up with our congregational meeting. We're gonna elect some new leaders and we're gonna see a PowerPoint put together uh, by Milan Pollock and, and me and see pictures from the past year. It'll be really great. So please join us for a congregational meeting 
on this same Zoom call after church today. You will also be getting this week probably a couple different emails. Uh, one of them will be uh, a survey going out about re-entering the church building. So as you know, Illinois is moving into phase four, which allows for gatherings up to uh, 50 people. However, there are a lot of restrictions on that. Our council has adopted the recommendations put forth by the denomination, the synod that we're in, Metropolitan Chicago Synod of the ELCA. And part of those recommendations include safety precautions for in-person gatherings. That includes um, restrictions on singing. We, we, don't, we will not be able to be singing during phase four if we gather in person because singing is a super spreader and so there'd be no singing um, and there will, we would need to be wearing face masks if we meet in person. We would need to remain six feet apart. Um, and so as a result, if we were to have worship in person, it'd be, it'd look a bit different than what we've done in the past. Um, and so we're interested in hearing from you about whether it's really, you really excited to get back together in person and do an alternative form of worship that wouldn't involve singing and would still involve social distance, or whether getting back in person is not so much the priority for you and you would feel more safe staying on Zoom and continuing to do the worship service that we're doing now. Either way, we'll continue offering an online option. We're just trying to figure out um, some get, get some cues from you guys about how, how um, you would feel comfortable gathering or even if you would want to gather during this during these summer summer months. So we'll be putting together um, a team in July. Actually, we already have put together a team. It's um, Christy Wise, Al Swanson, Michelle Hauser, and I will be working in July to look at all the feedback we've gotten from you and the Synod recommendations and figure out if having some sort of in-person worship service starting in August is something that we want to do or not. So please give us your feedback about that when, when that gets sent out this week. I believe there will also be another announcement about our upcoming fundraiser. Robert, can you tell us about that? Pastor Allison, you must be clairvoyant because in fact there is one. So everybody, mark your calendars for July 18th, 5 p.m. We are going to be having our summer fundraiser and it is going to be awesome. You are not going to want to miss this. We are having a socially distanced buffet out in the church parking lot from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. catered by Backyard Barbecue. It'll be uh, your choice of chicken or pulled pork and then sides. We're also doing, uh, we're also going to have wine bottles available for $10 a bottle. Um, if you are interested in donating wine, uh, you can uh, bring wine bottles over to Chris McGlatchy. Um, Chris, would you, if you're, if you're comfortable, would you mind like putting your email in the chat box so that people can contact you about uh, dropping off wine? This is very important, people. You don't want to have the barbecue without the wine. And then after the, uh, after the meal, you're invited to take the meals back home and then enjoy a concert, um, a combination of live and pre-recorded uh, footage. Uh, at 7 p.m., which will be hosted online. Um, this will be featuring uh, local artists, including uh, Kurt Morrison of Tributosaurus and Justin Roberts. Uh, Hannah and I are going to be singing. Uh, so this is not to be missed. We're going to be sending out a congregational email tomorrow uh, with um, all of the information and all the ticket information, so you can buy tickets online. Um, but you could also buy tickets in person, too. Uh, we're working that out now. Uh, Cindy and I will have a conversation. Uh, and it's going to be a really nice evening, everybody. So uh, mark your calendars, July 18th. Thank you, Robert. I'm looking forward to that. I will be back for that. So that'll be great. Any other announcements before we begin service? Nope. All right, wonderful. Well, you'll notice in our opening prayer that um, today's service uh, commemorates the, the pride festivities that would have been happening this weekend if we were able to all you know, gather and go out and parade together. So that is, this is Pride Sunday, 
and we are at the 51st anniversary now of the Stonewall riots, which are the initial riots that kicked off this, this um, the thing that we're commemorating each year is the, the Stonewall riots, which was a really important moment in um, bringing attention to issues of civil liberties for LGBTQ folks. So this is year 51 and you'll see that coming up in the prayers. Let's prepare ourselves for worship. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And, and also with you. you. Let us pray. Transcendent God, you took human form and with it gender and sexuality, entering into our broken world, bearing our suffering along with us. We remember that on this day, 51 years ago, a riot bro broke out as a response to years of victimization and oppression about the LGBTQIA community. We lift up those lives and their voices, remembering their hardships. We ask you to send your spirit that we may listen to the voices of our neighbors and work together to end the oppression of your children who are hurt by discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender. As your child, Jesus Christ healed the woman who touched the hem of his cloak. Help us to provide healing to one another, removing the barriers that separate your beloved children from access to hope, safety, and life abundance. Let this church be a safe haven. We pray all this through your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. For our children's message today, I wanted to begin by showing a picture. Let's find it. Here it is. Do we recognize the people in this picture, perhaps? A little bit. 
There we go. Who are those people? I see Chris McGlocky and Ala, and I see myself, and I see Kira. This picture was taken at the Pride Parade last year. So one year ago, almost to the day, um, this, this group from St. John's went downtown and, well, it wasn't quite downtown, but went into the city and participated in the Pride Parade. You can see Chris's rainbow outfit and I have a rainbow skirt as well. I wanted to show you another picture. This is a picture from, I believe 2016, when I went down to the Pride Parade with another group. This is a group from Holy Trinity, another Lutheran church in Chicago. Maybe you recognize some of the people, probably not, but hopefully you recognize me all up, up there. <laughs> I wanted to show you this picture because I wanted to point out something that the people are holding. These things that people are holding. We have one here and one here and we have one here. Can somebody tell me what those are? One of the kids? What are these things that are being held? Ben's not around. <laughs> I see his parents looking for him. Thanks. A pride flag. A pride flag, exactly. I was going to, I thought you would say it was a flag and I was going to ask you what it represents. So we have a rainbow on here, which has to do with pride, right? Any ideas about why the rainbow is representing this, this day? Hmm. Well, I'll take a stab at it. I don't know exactly for sure, but my guess is that the rainbow with its different stripes, all its different colors, it reminds us that there's a lot of different kinds of people. There's diversity in creation. And so in the case of pride, we're talking about diversity in terms of gender and sexual orientation. So people who are men and women and transgender people, people who are gay and straight and asexual and bisexual, all these different kinds of people. They're like different colors that make up the rainbow. And all together, we make up this beautiful creation, even though we're not all the same. In fact, it's even more beautiful to have so many different things. I wanna share with you today a story about the flag, about this pride flag and where it came from. I just learned because of reading this story, who developed this flag. And I wanna share the story with you. So please enjoy as we read. Maybe. Hmm. Well, my link is not working. So we're gonna find it on YouTube instead. How about that? Doody doody do. Where is it? There it is. All right. We're going to reshare. This time we're going to watch it on YouTube. There it is. Share computer sound. All right. Here we go. By Rob Sanders, illustrator. Pride, the story of Harvey Milk and the Rainbow Flag, written by Rob Sanders, illustrated by Stephen Salerno, read with permission from Random House Children's Books. You have to give them hope, hope for a better world, hope for a better tomorrow. Harvey Milk was an ordinary man, but he had an extraordinary dream. That dream would change history. Harvey dreamed that everyone, even gay people, would have equality. He dreamed that he and his friends would be treated like everyone else. He dreamed that one day, people would be able to live and love as they pleased. With his New York accent, Harvey talked to everyone about his dream. His voice boomed, his body bounced with energy and excitement. Some people listened, a few agreed, most did not. 
but Harvey's big voice and his big dream wouldn't be stopped. He discovered that the best way to change laws was to help make laws. In 1977, Harvey Milk took a big step toward that dream when he became one of the first openly gay people to be elected to political office in the United States. Harvey and his friends planned marches to protest inequality and unfair laws. And just days before one of the marches, Harvey had an idea. A symbol, he thought. We need a symbol that shows who we are and how we feel. Something to carry during the march. Something to make people feel they're a part of a community. Something to give people hope. Something extraordinary. Harvey knew an artist who could help, Gilbert Baker. Harvey asked. Gilbert said, we need a flag. Volunteers arrived to help Gilbert's design come to life. Together, they dipped fabric into large barrels filled with vivid, vibrant dyes. They cut and pieced and sewed until Harvey, Gilbert, and the other activists had a flag. A flag with eight colorful stripes. A flag that Harvey hoped would give hope. Rights are won by those who make their voices heard. On June 25th, 1978, when it was time for the march, a breeze stirred in San Francisco, the flag unfurled, the wind blew, the flag fluttered, flapped and flew, a rainbow as bright and unique as the men and women and people who walked behind it led the march. Harvey and the people asked for equality. They asked to be treated like everyone else. They asked to live and love as they pleased. They hoped the march would make a difference. Harvey was proud of the flag and proud of himself. He hoped others would be proud too. Five months later, on the morning of November 27, 1978, Harvey and the mayor of San Francisco, George Moscone, were assassinated. Their lives were taken by a man who did not think like Harvey or feel like him or love like him. The flag did not fly on that dark, sad night. Instead, thousands and thousands of people marched silently, carrying candles. The candlelight wove through the streets of San Francisco, up and down hills and around city buildings, a mile of glowing candlelight in honor of two lives lost. That could have been the end of Harvey's dream and the colorful flag, but it wasn't. More rainbow flags were created. Some of the colors changed. Eight stripes became six stripes, but the meaning of the flag did not change. It was a flag of equality. More and more people began to think of the flag as their flag, and they began to feel pride. They began to have hope. In 1994, Gilbert Baker designed another rainbow flag. This one was larger than all the rest. Women and men, people side by side carried the flag, a proud mile long rainbow floating through New York City. The flag wove through the streets, up and down avenues and boulevards and around city buildings. The people demanded equality. They demanded to be treated like everyone else. They demanded to live and love as they pleased. They were proud. They had hope they would make a difference. I ask for the movement to continue, for the movement to grow. More rainbow flags were made. Some were printed on bumper stickers and t-shirts. Others were hoisted onto lampposts on Halstead Street in Chicago. One was hung in the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Soon, the rainbow flag was flying in other countries like Brazil, England, Israel, Russia, Singapore, and Turkey. The rainbow flag now unfurled on farms, in suburbs, and in cities. The flag flew proudly outside public buildings, hotels, shops, restaurants, churches, and homes. And once on June 26, 2015, the White House was awash in the colors of the rainbow flag. Equality, pride, hope, love, Harvey's dream became a flag for us all. I like that story about the flag. It's a cool story because it it's both sad and happy. It has the parts about RV dying. He has a dream for the world, for freedom, for his people. 
but then he's killed because of what he believes in. This tends to happen a lot of times when we have leaders who are really passionate about something and trying to make change. It happened with Martin Luther King Jr. And of course we know it happened with Jesus, our Lord. What's cool in a lot of these cases is that the movement lives on beyond them. You know, Jesus died and the church rose up even after his death and continued. Uh, Martin Luther King died and the Poor People's Campaign has now risen up and we're continuing the movement. And Harvey Milk died as well as many other activists, but we still have the pride flag and we're picking it up where the leaders from the past have, have left off and we're carrying it forward. And we're doing that out of love and respect for one another and out of our calling as Christians to build a just and loving world that welcomes everyone. Please pray with me. Dear God, thank you for all the different kinds of people in the world. Thank you for love that is shown for all people and between all people. Thank you for families of every size and formation. Help us to love one another as you first loved us. Amen. Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Jesus said to the twelve, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise, Praise to you, Lord. O Christ. Welcome in the name of Christ. Welcome to you who are young, to you who are old, and to you who are middle-aged. Welcome to you who are male, to you who are female, and to you who are trans or gender non-conforming. Welcome to you who are wealthy, to you who are poor, and to you who are working class. Welcome. Our gospel reading this morning is all about welcome. Whoever welcomes you, whoever welcomes a prophet, whoever welcomes a righteous person, whoever welcomes one of these little ones will be enriched. Hospitality. The welcoming of the stranger is one of the primary biblical values. So many churches today claim to be welcoming places. All are welcome, they write on their signs, bulletins, and websites. You hear it again and again, all are welcome. But what does it mean? What does it mean for a church, a family, or a person to be truly welcoming? I invite you to think with me for a moment about a time when you felt welcomed. Where was it or when was it? Perhaps it was in a new job where your skills were valued and people seemed genuinely interested in you. 
Perhaps it was when you moved into a new neighborhood and neighbors brought you gifts and invited you to parties hoping to get to know you. Perhaps you have felt most welcomed when you have returned home to your family after a time away. Now think with me for a moment about a time you did not feel welcomed or perhaps you were offered a false welcome. This could have also been at a new job. Perhaps you were hired and even introduced to the company with a warm welcome email, but those words of welcome were followed up with a lack of interest in you as a person and zero willingness to incorporate your ideas into the workplace systems. Perhaps it was when you moved into a new neighborhood and your welcome gifts from neighbors were accompanied by stern words about how people your age should be more respectful of others and strict directions on where you were and were not to park your car. Or maybe, perhaps most painfully of all, it was when you returned home to family after a time away and instead of being embraced, you felt ignored or even like you were in the way. Welcome, as we all know, is about more than words. It's about more than a sign that reads all are welcome. And believe it or not, welcome is also about more than friendliness. Many churches pride themselves on being welcoming, but often what they mean is that they're very friendly. When you come to their church, they will greet you with a smile. They will offer you a bulletin and perhaps even make sure you know where the bathrooms are. They will tell you how glad they are to see you and invite you to come back anytime. This kind of warm, friendly welcome is wonderful, but this is only the first step. I know many people who have attended churches that claim to be welcoming and that are indeed very friendly to first and second time visitors. And yet for many churches, the welcome only goes that far. People are friendly and they may even tolerate some diversity. But when it comes down to it, many churches are not open to being changed by the people who visit. They are friendly, but they expect the visitor to assimilate to the culture of the church, rather than letting the church be changed by the new ideas and practices that visitors bring. Many of these churches may also tolerate diversity but of course, to be tolerated is not the same as to be wanted. I'm sure you felt the difference, people tolerating your presence despite your oddities versus people embracing you because of the uniqueness and particularities that you bring. In our gospel reading today, Jesus says that whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will be enriched. And whoever righteous a wel welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will be enriched. This phrase, in the name of, is an idiom that really means because of. In other words, whoever welcomes a prophet because they are a prophet. And whoever welcomes a righteous person because they are a righteous person. In the passage just before this, Jesus tells the disciples that when they go out to preach and to heal, they will be rejected by many. That their prophethood and their righteousness will make them social pariahs. That people will avoid them because of the message that they bring. But then Jesus goes on to assure them that though they will be rejected by many, they will be welcomed by some. And this welcome will not be in spite of the message that they bring, but because of the message that they bring. I have many LGBTQ friends. I myself am bisexual, as many of you know. Many of my friends have people in their lives who tolerate them. People who perhaps knew and loved them before they came out as queer and now continue to love them despite this fact. In some relationships, 
that's the most that is possible. To be loved despite of aspects of your identity that are deemed unacceptable or shameful. And yet, I wonder if you have experienced something more. I wonder if you have experienced being loved not just despite who you are, but because of who you are. Being loved for all the nuances that make you, you. Having the unique parts of yourself not just be tolerated, but celebrated, embraced. I can tell you that for LGBTQIA folks, this is like a breath of fresh air. To be embraced, not despite of their identity, but to have that identity be fully embraced as well. To have our full selves be accepted, not just parts of ourselves. True welcome is about this kind of full embrace. True welcome is when you feel safe enough to reveal who you really are, all of who you are, and to trust that this revelation will be received as a gift to the community, not just something to be tolerated. True welcome also means that the one doing the welcoming is opening themselves up to being changed. It is easy to invite someone into your group and expect them to change in order to fit in. It is another thing entirely to invite someone into your group knowing that their presence will change things. Knowing that they will have new ideas in a new style and that integrating those ideas and styles will involve everyone in the group needing to shift how they do things in order to make room. And most importantly of all, True welcome involves recognizing that those changes and those shifts in practices and styles are a gift to the community. They help us in our spiritual growth, teaching us to expand our communal and individual practices of love and empathy. True welcome is when these changes are not just tolerated, but embraced as an opportunity for growth and new learning. Whoever welcomes the prophet because they are a prophet will receive the reward. Whoever welcomes a righteous person because they are a righteous person will be enriched. Whoever gives drink to one of these little ones will not miss out on the gift that they bring. The stranger in our midst is a blessing if we embrace the transformation that they invite. You yourself are a gift to the community to your workplace, to your neighborhood, to your family, and to your church, if those communities choose to truly welcome you. I hope on this Pride Sunday that God will grant you the grace to welcome yourself, all the parts of who you are, and that God will grant us, the people of St. John's, the blessing that is received when we welcome all of our neighbors. Amen.
With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. We thank you, God, for your prophets who hold up a mirror to ourselves to show us our truth, as hard and unpleasant as that may be, into our true nature and record, freeing us to choose to change and correct our ways such that we may begin again to better and more closely follow your boundless and universal, all-loving will instead of our own selfish will. Lord, we praise you. Thanks be, thanks to, God. God. Thanks be to God. We thank you, God, for all of the refreshing rain that you have blessed us with recently, helping all of the trees, vegetables, fruits, and other plants to grow beautifully lush and full moisturizing the thirsty dry earth and baptizing all of your creation fresh once again with new life in its due season once more this year. Lord, we praise you. Thanks be to God. We thank you, God, for giving us free choice because you want us to be free to want to choose to follow your ways. And we celebrate our freedom of choice as a nation founded on this value next weekend. Lord, we praise you. Thanks. 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 Dear, God. Dear God, as we celebrate our independence and freedom of choice amidst warmer, more beautiful weather and loosening restrictions, we humbly ask you to shepherd and guide us to choose and discern our way wisely, that we may continue to be liberal and progressive in our love of all people while simultaneously conservative in our interpretation and application of the CDC guidelines, such that we may cause no further harm by contributing to the further spread of COVID-19, knowing that while we may get to take vacation and celebrate holidays, this virus knows no holiday and works continuously in exploiting our love of independence and free choice. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Dear God, as Pride Month June 2020 draws to a close, 
And today we celebrate the 51st anniversary of the Stonewall Riots. We are grateful for the recently passed and much long overdue legislation, which now prevents employers from discriminating against our LGBTQIA siblings. Lord, we praise you. Thanks, Thanks to you. God. Be to God. Dear God, following last weekend's Poor People's Campaign Mass Digital Assembly, we ask that you guide us in discerning wisely what is to be our part in helping to repair the damage and harm that has been wrought upon our black siblings for hundreds of years in this country. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. Yeah. Our prayer. Dear God, be with us during our annual meeting today. As we elect new officers for our congregation, we thank you for the ministry of all you have called to be spiritual leaders and ask that you guide and lead them all in a truly humble spirit of servant leadership. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Yeah. Hear our prayer. People of God, for whom else shall we pray? I pray for a safe passage today as I travel to North Carolina. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. I pray for our congregation as we continue to, to discern how best to meet and to be with one another. And for all those who somehow are not able to participate in our worship. God, in your mercy. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray. Trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. For our offertory today, we have a special gift of music by Lila Shutters, who is learning to play the violin. And I'm especially delighted because she's taking violin lessons from a good friend of mine um, and former fellow teacher uh, who lives just a block away from where I live in Chicago. So I'm happy to uh, present Lila playing French folk song. I just want to play it one more time. So if you missed it the first time, let's hear it one more time. Thank you, Lila, for your music. Let us share the meal together. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with, you. with you. Lift up your hearts. We, we lift, lift them up, up to the Lord. the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, it is to, right give to give him thanks and praise. praise. At this time, I invite you to pick up your bread and hold it at eye level as it is blessed. 
In the night in which he was betrayed, arrested and denied, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to all who were gathered there. The disciples, their spouses, their children, the cooks, the keeper of the upper room, the one who would betray him, the one who would deny him, the one who would doubt him, the ones who would abandon him, and the ones who would sit at the foot of the cross. And he said to them all, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this and remember me. You may set down the bread and pick up your cups. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the release from sin. Do this and remember me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as our Lord Jesus taught us in the languages and translations of our hearts. Our parents in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We know that even though we are physically apart, Christ is present in this real and true gathering of the church and in this meal that we share together. I invite you to eat bread and drink from your cup, the body and blood of Christ given for you. Let us place. God of the welcome table, in this meal we have feasted on your goodness and have been united by your presence among us. Empower us to go forth, sustained by these gifts, so that we may share your neighborly love with all, through Jesus Christ, the giver of abundant life. Amen. 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 Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint hearted, support the weak and help the suffering. Honor all people, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Creator, the Christ and the Holy Spirit, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Amen. I am pleased to share with you a very special video put together by Robert with a lot of um, love and diligence, you will see some very familiar faces.
Thank you to everyone who participated in today's mass choir and um, instrumental ensemble. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Bye.